Welcome to EAU TV. My name is Sikki Gillesen. I'm a medical oncologist from Switzerland and I'm joined today for hopefully an interesting discussion with Rina Eaps, right, um, from Australia and Peter Johnstone from Florida in the US. So, so welcome and if I may start, because we had today the uh, the first session, uh, the plenary session about palliative care, so something that's important, but maybe sometimes a bit neglected in, in our conferences. And uh, Peter, um, you gave a fantastic talk about um, how can we treat bone pain? That is really something we see a lot, not only in prostate cancer, but in reality also in kidney cancer. So maybe you can tell us a bit about um, what, how you treating bone pain in our patients. Sure, Silky, thank you very much. The important thing to think about when you start thinking about bone pain in the urologic uh, community is that there's a lot of people who focus on it in a multidisciplinary way, just like we do with, say, bladder cancer or prostate cancer. Bone pain is something that radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, orthopedists, neurosurgeons work together. And this morning, I didn't speak much about bisphosphonates or some of the bone-seeking agents that are systemic. But just for the purpose of, po of uh, bony pain, radiation oncology, orthopedics, for the most part, handle these all the time. And, and certainly, if it's bony pain from spine lesions, then we deal that with our ortho orthopedic colleagues and our neurosurgery colleagues as well. Pain by itself in the spine is not necessarily a problem that we need to leap on aggressively. Certainly pain associated with neurologic dysfunction mm. or sensory changes in a, in a specific dermatome, that does call for imaging and, if possible, surgical intervention with laminectomy and things like this. Because early intervention, at least with steroids, but potentially with surgery if the patient's eligible, means a quicker response in terms of the neurologic dysfunction. But understand, there's plenty of patients who can't undergo that. So the steroids with judicious use of radiation therapy could really benefit them as well. Just, I think, the thing to remember about bony pain is that if you see bony pain, the orthopedists, the radiation oncologists have mechanisms to help with it. Either it's palliation, if it's not a particularly worrisome lesion, in terms of the structure of the bone, or surgery, open reduction, internal fixation, total hip arthroplasty, even a hip reconstruction, for instance, or a shoulder reconstruction. These things can be done to help with the pain, to help with the stability, and then radiation is used in conjunction with that. In the rare cases that we see, I, I guess uh, you, you know, will say the same, um, were, for example, in a prostate cancer patient who is not responding to radiotherapy with the pain. What what are you doing? Can you re irradiate? Can you? What what is your your recommendation for that? Re irradiation is a complex issue, and and in our center we don't generally do it within six months of the prior radiation. Although depending on the dose and the dosimetry and things like that. It, it may be reattempted. It also is a matter of what the patient's status is. If the, if the patient's heading off to hospice, for instance, then we can be more open-minded about doing that because the time until they, they would get the complication may be much briefer. Uh, surgery then plays a more active role. Some people have been looking at hyperthermia, but we don't have a set mechanism for that yet. Under those circumstances, we really do have to look at surgery versus the toxicity of rear radiation. And, and I guess when we go away from palliative to, to the curative setting, there's a lot of settings now where um, more and more we also speak about radiotherapy. And I just came back, and I think you as well, right from the bladder cancer session, where there was actually a very nice talk from uh, Valerie Fontaine um, from, from Belgium about the three modality approach for patients who, who want to keep their bladder. So I start with you, Reno, now. Uh, because so how do you see it? Um, how do you see it in Australia? Is that an option? Is that for you a standard option? Is it for you an alternative? How, how do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, radiotherapy for bladder cancer is now becoming, you know, in the mainstream practice. You know, in the in a while ago, we would reserve that for patients who weren't fit enough to have surgery. But I think, you know, now 
with younger patients being diagnosed and, um, you know, patients wanting a more bladder preserving approach, that is actually a very real option for, for many of our patients that we can consider. Interesting. What, what are you saying? What, what is done in the U.S.? Well, in the U.S., certainly radical cystectomy remains the mechanism of choice, but we do have a cadre of patients who would be suitable mm. for combined modality therapy. You can't ever take a patient to chemo radiation without having the urologist clear them first through a, a TURBT, for instance. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not taking the right patient to the chemo radiation. But it's also a combined follow-up afterwards as well, because the salvage for those patients, if they do have a local recurrence is the salvage cystectomy at that point. And a lot of, so my sense is a bit that in the UK, this was a standard like some time, right? And now it starts obviously also in Australia to be a bit something that can be done or when patient, like a patient says he, he or she wants to keep the bladder. So the US seems you are still going with the cystectomy as the standard of care option then. I think we have an increasing rate of trimodality therapy. As well. But it's, okay. it's probably being done honestly at academic centers at this point. Okay, interesting. So now, obviously, we have to ask for the new adjuvant trial with lutetium PSMA. You presented shortly in the game changing session, yes. you know, very elegantly. So oh. thank you very much. So it's do okay. you want to say, maybe explain a bit what, what the trial is about? And then we can maybe talk a bit about um, what we think about the yeah, so it was a, it was it's been a very exciting and intriguing trial to to be a part of. Um, so the lutectomy trial was looking at a very early use of lutetium PSMA. You know, we know it has promise in metastatic castration resistant yes. prostate cancer, and we've seen the effects and patients tolerate it well. So and you know. With high-risk localized prostate cancer, there's a real area of unmet need where patients, despite curative attempts at treatment, will get biochemical recurrence and develop metastasis. So we wanted to see whether lutetium uh, PSMA um, uh, has an effect in that early setting. Um, now, you know, using it as an upfront treatment option, this trial was really to look at the dosimetry, mm -hmm. so how much dose of radiation we can get into the prostate and the lymph nodes that are affected by tumour, as well as how well the treatment is tolerated. So it was really a pilot trial mm -hmm. to look at the efficacy and the feasibility. Uh, and the most important, one of the most important things was how safe surgery would be after mm -hmm. giving something mm -hmm. like lutetium therapy. We have no idea. Um, so it was really a process of discovery for us. So... When we have you here, uh, Peter, so the question is, could you do the same effect maybe with SBRT? On the, because I was thinking that when you, know, when you present it, uh, just like... You can, person. but not to the nodes. And, and so there have been several trials of neoadjuvant SBRT. We had one at, at our center that was published. Uh, you've got to be very careful about what dose you give, and you've got to be very careful, again, in an integrated way to make sure that you don't mess up the surgery because uh, at this point mm -hmm. you want the surgeons to be able to get everything out and that the toxicity shouldn't be any worse than it would have been had they done radical prostatectomy on their own. And so one of the, the, the important aspects of the trials we've seen so far is just getting the dose right. But again, at this point, SBRT does not yet extend to nodes as well. So when I was, say my trial was in high risk patients, I didn't want patients who are at too high of a risk for mm -hmm. For, uh, for nodes, and if they were, the nodes were going to be taken care of by the surgery, not by any yeah. pre-op radiation. Yeah, that was quite interesting. The patient you showed with this five-centimeter yeah. lymph node, to be honest, I, I mean, outside of a trial, I wouldn't even uh, think that this is a, a patient where we would go for radical prostatectomy. So I yeah, don't know, absolutely. do you want to, to comment on this patient? That was quite amazing in, yeah. the, in your pictures. And, and that's why, in a way, he was ideal for this trial because there was not a pressing need to go straight for radical prostatectomy. He'd already had metastatic disease and a very big lymph node. Um, but, you know, once we gave him one cycle and we saw the, the biochemical response to that, it was, it was really quite remarkable um, how we responded to the two cycles of lutetium PSMA. And he went on to have a surgery and it's a year later and his PSA remains undetectable. So wow. A fantastic result for him. Yeah. But having said that, you know, um, this is, I think this is one of the benefits of, of lutetium 
being given in an upfront setting because it's a systemic treatment. It exactly. seeks out all the areas of PSMA expressing disease. And we know that a lot of biochemical failure is due to occult micrometastases that are not treated by the primary form of treatment. So lutetium PSMA seeks all those sites of disease out. Um, and and it's, so it's a very novel form of treatment. And I think the other advantage is, it, is that it's tolerated so well. So these are patients who are very well, you know, they could have surgery to treat their prostate cancer. So you want to make sure that whatever upfront neoadjuvant treatment you give them, it's it's going to be tolerated well. They're not going to have too many side effects. I understand. So, but just like in, in a situation like that, again, outside of a clinical trial, um, we would probably use the stampede um, scheme, right, with ADT plus abiratron, but only for some time, so two to three years, whatever. So the abiratron for two years, the ADT for two to three years, um, and the radiotherapy in a curative setting. And obviously, that's also very effective systemic therapy, and we already know that. So so my, my question a bit um, maybe also here to, to Peter, um, are you using this, this combination according based on Stampede uh, in the US, and what do you think about it? We are with radiation yes. in the in the uh, setting that you described. Yeah, in the QR. No, no, with radiation. But certainly yes. with radiation, we have data now that say in the oligometastatic setting that we should be treating the prostate. It's not quite as defined as we'd like, but at least there's one arm of the stampede trial that says that. And then there's certainly data that show that we should be treating a site of oligometastasis with limited metastatic disease using SBRT, or again, given the data from lutetium, at least something to consider. So yes, we're, we're seeing a lot more of these oligometastatic patients, certainly for prostate, certainly for renal cell, less frequently for other lesions that we are treating in a definitive way. Right. So, so I guess, I mean, that was more an N plus setting. So where you could do the curative radiotherapy in a, and then adding the two things. And, and as you said, I mean, there is the stampede data showing even in the low volume metastatic setting that maybe radiation to the primary could, could help something. So the lutetium, I think, is a bit out of the way right now because yeah. at least in, I don't know how it is in Australia, at least in, uh, in Europe, we at the moment, we don't even have access for our patients with the proven benefit of um, with patients with MCRPC. So we hope really that these logistics problems are going to be solved very soon, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, this is the earliest setting uh, for the use of lutetium PSMA in the, in the prostate right. cancer disease spectrum. Um, and I think, you know, what, what our results sort of have shown is that, you know, it is well tolerated and you can get good doses of targeted radiation to the to the sites of disease and it's w at least worth exploring further yeah no i agree it's it's nice i i guess my my kind of idea is that this goes probably a bit later um in our in our treatment algorithm but i hope i will be con then convinced otherwise <laughs> So thank you both very much for this discussion. I think it was very interesting and uh, I hope to see you later in the EAU. Thank you, Silky. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.